All right. Well, um, good afternoon to to you all. It's uh, still the early morning for me, but I'm really pleased to have the chance to um, talk to you all about cancer and um, evolution. You give me just a sec. Looks like I have still the Zoom group chat up. I'm going to get rid of it so that it's not in my way as I'm looking at my slides. Great. Now, so I am an interdisciplinary scientist. I work on um, cooperation theory as sort of my main focus, but I work on lots of different systems, everything from human sharing and cooperation to how cells inside the body cooperate with one another to make us functional, and then how that breaks down in cancer. And I want to begin by sharing with you one of my favorite um, organisms. This is a, a crested cactus, and I think it's a really interesting illustration of some of the processes of evolution that can happen inside organisms, because you can actually see by looking at this form how the um, cellular proliferation changes the structure of the cactus. And my colleagues and I we created a garden at Arizona State University of these crested cacti to communicate with people about cancer. So um, we worked with the groundskeepers, we worked with gardeners um, to install this really lovely garden at ASU that it's now thriving and it's um, been written about in some magazines and articles um, because it provides a way for not just scientists but the general public also to wrap their heads around some really complex issues with evolution and cancer because the cells themselves are proliferating in a way that can make it difficult for the organism to maintain its usual form. But what's really fascinating about these cacti is that they can often live for a very long time, even with these mutated forms. So they also provide a way for us to think about how does life actually live with cancer? And how is that also part of the evolutionary legacy of cancer. So as I give you my talk today, we'll kind of come back to both these issues of what's happening inside organisms as they evolve and um, as the cells evolve in terms of overproliferation and other phenotypes of cancer. And then also think about how we can look at cancer differently in terms of ways of living with it as opposed to just trying to eradicate cancer. One of the other things to me that's really important about these crested cacti is that they make it very clear that cancer is not something that's just unique to humans. It's something that spans all of multicellular life. And that means that we really are not alone in having a struggle with cancer. It's something that all multicellular life forms face. So to tell you a little bit more about how I got interested in these questions about cancer and cooperation and cellular cheating, I'll give you a little bit of background about my work. So I study questions about what makes cooperation stable, especially as it scales up from small scale interactions of a few individuals to very large scale interactions. So for example, if you have a few humans interacting, it can be easy to maintain cooperation. But as you go to larger and larger groups, there are more challenges to maintaining that cooperation there are also more opportunities that you can get from cooperation when you have larger groups. You can have division of labor, you can have um, production of public goods that everybody can benefit from. But as groups get bigger, it also becomes more difficult to detect and suppress cheating. So larger groups um, have more of a problem with cheating. And this is the case for human groups, but it's also the case 
for cellular groups. And many of the same problems that have to be solved when you're scaling up groups um, from a few individuals to many individuals, uh, the structure of those problems is the same across many different kinds of systems. They manifest differently, different mechanisms, um, sometimes different ways that enforcement can happen, um, and sometimes different ways that elimination of cheaters happen, but many of the same general principles apply. I did all of my um, graduate work at the University of Pennsylvania, where I focused on um, evolution and behavior, in particular, creating computational models of the evolution of cooperation and really looking at simple mechanisms that can allow cooperation to be maintained. This is a screenshot of a model that I created called the walkaway model which is very simple. The individuals in it just leave when they interact with um, individuals who are defectors or join groups that have too many defectors. Um, and, and this is sufficient to maintain cooperation in the whole population. But if we think now about multicellularity, multicellularity is about having a group that is a stable group um, without having individuals leave and go off on their own. Um, obligate multicellularity sort of requires this commitment to the group. So there needs to be internal mechanisms for dealing with cheating. So, um, so this is kind of where I, I began with my work on the evolution of cooperation. But once I started working on cancer in multicellular bodies and that problem of cheating, um, we have to look at much more complex mechanisms other than just this walkaway strategy. So after my um, graduate work, I did a postdoc in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Arizona, not Arizona State University, they're two different places. Um, and that's where I started working on cancer evolution. And it's also when I got introduced to these wonderful crested cacti and um, started to think about them very deeply as these ways of representing many different aspects of cancer evolution and how cancer is really entwined with our evolutionary history. After that, I went to UCSF, where I um, co-founded the Center for Evolution and Cancer there with Carlo Maley, and um, we started holding meetings um, about evolution in cancer there. Um, they've now turned into the International Society for Evolution, Ecology, and Cancer. Um, we have meetings every two years. And yeah, so that's a sort of short summary. Now I'm at Arizona State University, where I um, run an interdisciplinary group called the um, Interdisciplinary um, Cooperation Initiative. And um, we look at cooperation from all of these different perspectives and, and um, how systems deal with cheating. So now let's return to this question about um, how cancer originally emerged. And in order to look at that, we have to go back to the very origins of multicellularity. Because really what multicellularity is, fundamentally, it's about cellular cooperation. So in order for multicellularity to happen, cells have to be able to control their proliferation, control cell death, they have to um, be able to create an extracellular environment that allows them to adhere to each other and function well together. And you also have mechanisms for allocating resources, so cells get the resources that they need, and of course, dividing labor. So these are um, what we've called the foundations of multicellular cooperation. And these were really critical in that transition from unicellularity to multicellularity. Cancer, on the other hand, is really a breakdown of many of these features of multicellular cooperation. So if we look at these traits that we see in multicellular organisms, these foundations that are required from multicellularity to be viable, when we look at cancer, we see a breakdown of each of these. 
And um, these also, um, these map on to other approaches to cancer as well. So if you um, are wondering right now, well, what do I mean by cheating? I want to be clear that I'm not saying that the cells are intentionally doing anything. Cheating is simply a way of talking about situations where there's a breaking of shared rules, and that leads to a fitness advantage for that individual that is breaking the rule. In the case of cancer, these shared rules are implicit um, in the sense that they are encoded in the DNA of all of the cells in the multicellular organism. And so when cancer suppression mechanisms or systems that regulate cooperation are uh, mutated, when the genes regulating those are mutated, that can lead to a fitness advantage for the cells that are violating those rules. And those mutations, because they give rise to oftentimes cellular cheating, that can provide an advantage for the cells that are, are cheating. So some of the ways that cells can take advantage of the body are through proliferating when they shouldn't, using more resources than they should, and in general, not really participating in this cellular commons, really, that is part of, that is what makes a multicellular body a multicellular body. So what happens after this cheating emerges is that evolutionary dynamics come into play where the cells that are cheating are able to gather more resources and reproduce more quickly, survive better. This makes them grow in frequency. Um, so in future cellular generations inside the body, there are more of them. They also oftentimes accumulate more mutations, and this can both lead to initiation of cancer, and it can also accelerate the progression of cancer. This is another way of... Вот существует такая очень интересная... Pardon me? Um, sorry. <laughs> Wrong channel. Would you like me to continue? Um, yes, please. Yes, please. And then when these break down, we have cancer. When the foundations of multicellular cooperation are compromised. Now, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the hallmarks of cancer. And what's quite fascinating is um, the hallmarks of cancer map on um, quite well to this cellular cheating framework. There are several hallmarks that are within the categories of uncontrolled proliferation and inappropriate cell survival, also resource monopolization. And interestingly, um, dysregulated differentiation is not technically one of the hallmarks, but it is something that pathologists um, are very attentive to when they are diagnosing cancer. Um, so we've argued that this framework of looking at cancer as a breakdown of cellular cheating can potentially help to unify approaches to cancer that have come from sort of different sub-disciplines and looking at different levels at cancer. Um, so uh, we're right now completing work on a paper that goes much deeper into this question of whether dysregulated differentiation may be a missing hallmark of cancer. We argue that, yeah, that it probably is a missing hallmark of cancer. So in this way of looking at cancer, um, all of a sudden now there's a sort of a switch from thinking of cancer as this thing that is, um, uh, you know, a disease that is maybe human specific or um, really something that kind of, um, you know, is not fundamental to life. Um, and instead thinking about it as something that is, that where our vulnerability to it is built into the very structure of multicellularity itself. 
Uh, now I would like to share with you a, um, a project that I um, done with a rap artist to explain some of the basics of evolution in cancer to a broad audience. It's a very short video, um, but I wanted to share it with you um, because I think it's a good example of how um, we can use some of these um, ideas about cellular cheating and the evolution of multicellularity and um, bring them together into something that is accessible to a, a broad audience. And it's also, it's also fun. So look, tell me if um, you're not able to hear the sound. time also working on this with um, Baba Brinkman. We uh, went back and forth discussing the science. He read several papers and um, then we worked together on the lyrics to make sure that um, they were scientifically accurate. So um, Baba Brinkman's a great rap artist. All of his raps are peer reviewed. I think he's the only peer reviewed rap artist out there. So if you're interested, definitely um, check out his, the rest of his work. Okay, now here we are. Um, okay, so back to our um, cancer across life and um, taking a look at how cancer manifests across life. Okay. 
Hmm, my slides are not moving. I'm going to escape and go back in, see if that helps. My slides are frozen. Well, maybe I will give it a few minutes to see if it'll resolve itself. And in the meantime, I can talk to you about some of the, um, oh, here we are, great. So here's a, um, uh, this is representative of work that I did with a really great group of scientists at the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin, the Institute for Advanced Study. We um, looked across um, all of the existing literature, this was about five years ago, um, at examples of cancer and cancer-like phenomena that occurred <clears throat> or that were reported across the tree of life. And this was um, really before um, comparative oncology um, was, was well developed. So, so this was our, um, really our first attempt at making sense of what was already out there. Um, and uh, I want to show you just a few images um, that I think are, um, are, are quite interesting. If my slides will work correctly here. All right, so here's an example in um, a mushroom of dis dysregulated differentiation where you have the gills appearing on the top. And this we classified as a, a cancer-like phenomenon as opposed to cancer itself. So um, when there was only dif loss of differentiation or inappropriate tissue differentiation or a um, loss of control of um, proliferation, um, if there's too much proliferation, we call those cancer-like phenomena. We only categorize them as cancer themselves if there was evidence of invasion or metastasis. Um, and here are some um, examples of cancer in green algae, um, which include, you know, most of what we know of as plants. They fit in the taxon of green algae. Um, and on the bottom, that what you see there is actually a pine tree that has um, a fasciation um, where it's it's basically creating trunk material that's fanning out. Um, and so it's not differentiating properly. Um, and plants of um, this broader phenomenon called fasciation, where you get abnormal growth patterns um, because the meristem, so the what are essentially the stem cells for plants, they are um, replicating in abnormal ways. So how is it that multicellular bodies detect and control cellular cheating so that they don't succumb to cancer? There are several different levels of regulation that occur. Some of them are internal to every cell. So you can almost think of it as though every cell has a cellular conscience. Again, I'm not saying they actually do, but as a metaphor, um, where they're monitoring their own expression state, the, um, whether their proteins are misfolded, if there's DNA damage, there's viruses, and um, then changing their gene expression if they note that something is not right, um, and that can help to control um, cancer overall. There's also neighborhood mechanisms. So ways that cells are sort of keeping track of the cells that they're connected to and the cells that they're nearby and sending signals back and forth. And then there's also a system-wide um, system set of mechanisms. For example, the immune system's ability to um, sort of detect if there are regions that have abnormal proliferation and, um, and then sort of go to those and deal with potential threats. So, it's really a multi-layer system, and, and this makes sense because multicellular bodies have evolved um, to regulate cellular cheating, to keep it under control for millions of years. And together, these systems help to 
eliminate those um, cells that are behaving in ways that are not consistent with the foundations of multicellular cooperation. One of the mechanisms for suppressing cancer that is a cell intrinsic mechanism that um, is, is very interesting is TP53. And um, we can think of it as the cheater detector of the genome or one of the cheater detectors of the genome. It's a, a central node in a very complex information processing network. It's integrating signals from many different places in the cell. And then essentially what it does is it processes information in order to make a decision. Um, again, not a conscious one, but it's using all of this information to um, then sort of decide the fate of that cell. Will it complete the cell cycle? Does it require DNA repair? Or is it a threat to the organism and should it undergo programmed cell death? So this is one way of just looking in a broad picture at how um, P53 is um, really integrating information from many different areas of cell function. Now, how is it that TP53 detects cellular cheating? Well, there are many different downstream consequences that occur when cells are, are cheating. And those can be reflected in the proteins that are being produced, in um, the rate of cellular proliferation, and essentially the genetic network is tapping in to that information that is available um, just from the behavior of the cells. So now I want to take us back to these crested cacti, um, this garden that we have um, in Arizona, um, at Arizona State University where I am now and um, where I'm a co-lead in the Arizona Cancer Evolution Center, where really we look at um, cancer from both the perspective of somatic evolution, how cells are evolving inside bodies, and from the perspective of comparative oncology, looking across species at cancer. Um, we also have many efforts for outreach and education. Um, and um, I'm one of the, the leads of the that outreach and education team as well. So in terms of comparative oncology, one of the most important foundational ideas in compar comparative oncology is that um, it's called PETO's paradox, which is this idea that cancer susceptibility doesn't scale with body size. So the, the larger an organism is, that doesn't mean it gets more cancer. Now, you might think if cancer is just a matter of, you know, having more cells, having them around longer, they have a chance of mutating every year, that it should be the case that larger organisms are more susceptible to cancer. And in fact, if we go back to the very beginning of my presentation, um, where I was talking about how larger, you know, when you scale up cooperation, it becomes harder to solve that problem of cheating. You might expect an elephant to have greater susceptibility to cancer than a mouse or a human, but that's not what we see actually. It doesn't scale with body size. So we, um, and we know this now because we have a um, very large project that is funded by the National Cancer Institute where we are looking at a database um, with hundreds of thousands of records um, that allow us to look across species at cancer. And so this comparative oncology database um, has many different species in it from many different places. Um, it is currently led by my former postdoc, um, Dr. Amy Boddy, who is now an assistant professor at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And um, she has been um, working to cultivate this database for a, a, ever since she began working with me as a postdoc. And now it's at the point where um, we have some interesting data that um, I can um, share some with you. Um, some of our, our findings, they're not yet published. 
So um, one of the subsets of the data that we're looking at is the life history data. So this is data on um, lifespan and um, data on body size and, and also other um, some reproductive factors. And sort of in, and so in this subset of the database, um, we have about 30,000 individuals and um, more than 7,000 individuals that have um, abnormal proliferation listed. And um, what we see is that the rate of neoplasia is not, it does not go up as body size and um, longevity go up. Um, the pattern is flat, perhaps a little bit negative. Um, and I, I should also mention that these analyses were done by a graduate student, um, Valerie Harris. And now we can think a little bit about, well, why is it that larger organisms are not more susceptible to cancer? And it turns out that um, there's evidence that they have greater cancer suppression systems. And this makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. If you're a long-lived organism and you're large, then in order to successfully reproduce, um, you have to have more cancer suppression mechanisms in place. It turns out that elephants have multiple copies of the tumor suppressor gene TP53. And also um, elephant cells are more likely to undergo cell death in response to radiation. And that's functionally linked to these copy, extra copies of TP53. There's also evidence from a, another um, group. So this is not our, um, our team. Um, so it's sort of convergent evidence that this is um, a, an important factor that um, the copy number of TP53 um, increased as body size increased for the evolution of elephants. So they were able to do this by comparing the genome of modern elephants with woolly mammoth and mastodon genomes to see that um, essentially as body mass went up, um, that um, body mass or evolution may have been driving um, the evolution of increased copy numbers of TP53. In general, there seems to be evidence of positive selection um, on cancer genes in whales and dolphins as well. Um, this is a part of our team. Mark Tolis has been leading this work as well. So it's not just in elephants that there's um, positive selection on genes that are involved in things like cell cycle checkpoints and um, apoptotic pathways. So the main conclusion that we're drawing at the moment from this is that large scale and long lived multicellularity really um, needs to have these cellular um, cheating suppression mechanisms in place in order for it to be viable. So one way of thinking about cancer suppression mechanisms really is that they are um, cellular cheater suppression mechanisms. And that means that on some level we can think about multicellular bodies as, uh, as possessing a sort of collective cellular intelligence that helps to keep cancer under control. And now this is a collective, cell or collective intelligence maybe in the same way that you might think about an ant colony as having collective intelligence or a bee colony having collective intelligence, um, where the actions of all of the um, components of it allow for higher level functions that aren't possible um, without having that collective. So in the last few minutes, I want to ask and answer a little bit this question about cancer, what the future is of cancer. So how do, does this new understanding of cancer change the way that we treat cancer and what cancer might look like for us in the future? And one thing I think that's very exciting is that there are the develop, there's the development now of many evolutionarily informed treatments that are aimed at helping to control cancer. And some strategies that are really promising include 
aiming at co um, supporting cooperation of normal cells, helping to support the cheater detection systems, the cellular cheater detector since detection systems that are already there. Also disrupting um, the cooperation that can happen among cancer cells. I didn't really have time to talk about that today, but there's also evidence that cancer cells cooperate with one another in, in order to exploit the body. So we can interfere with that. Um, slowing down evolutionary process inside the body also and um, minimizing the evolution of resistance. I'll give a few more details about some of these now. So um, one, uh, one approach is to, to also consider how can we take some of the insights from treating infectious disease from an evolutionary perspective and apply that to treating cancer from an evolutionary perspective. Um, this is uh, work that I did with Bob Gatenby, who um, pioneered a lot of really fascinating approaches to cancer control in the clinic, and Gunther Janssen, who is an infectious disease evolution expert. And essentially what we did is, excuse me, <coughs> Um, is we took a look at all the strategies that were used in infectious disease control from an evolutionary perspective and then applied them to cancer. And this is really a summary of it. The most important thing I think to, to take from this is that we, you know, in cancer treatment, often the aim really is killing cancer cells, but um, preventing host damage also, I think, should be a very important piece of that. Um, and it's something that's often not focused on um, in, in cancer treatment, because usually what is done is people are given the maximum tolerated dose, um, which is essentially what's the most damage that you can do to the host without it totally destroying them, as opposed to what's the lowest dose that you can give um, while still being effective. This is another, um, I think, very promising um, area, which is uh, essentially if we can reduce the mutation rate, then um, what that does is it slows down the evolutionary process. And um, this is some work that was um, done by Carlo Maley and his colleagues, where they found that giving non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so like a baby aspirin, um, actually reduces the mutation rate um, in a precancerous condition called Barrett's esophagus. And it, that um, reduction of the mutation rate is associated with a reduced risk of progressing to cancer. Adaptive therapy, um, this I think is probably the most important innovation in treatment that has come from an evolutionarily informed perspective. Um, it's the approach that Bob Gatenby has pioneered at the Moffitt Cancer Center in um, Tampa, Florida. And essentially what adaptive therapy does is it aims to keep a, can a, a tumor um, under control rather than eradicating it. Um, so one of the problems with high-dose therapy is that it often selects for the cells that are most resistant to that therapy, which means that in the long term, it can become impossible to keep the tumor under control. Adaptive therapy, on the other hand, um, gives a moderately high dose initially to reduce the tumor size and then only treats when the tumor is growing. Um, and this is currently in clinical trials now, um, and the clinical trials have been extremely um, promising. So on the top, you see the individuals who are in the adaptive therapy condition. And on the bottom, you see the individuals who are in the standard um, treatment. And those Xs represent the progression to cancer. You see that the individuals who are in the adaptive therapy um, trial are surviving for, um, are they're they're surviving without cancer for a very long time, and and this trial is still going on now. I just um, corresponded with Bob Gatenby a few weeks ago, and he said that many of these individuals are still continuing to do extremely well. So. 
I think it's very, very promising. And um, new clinical trials are starting there at um, Moffitt, and we're actually um, in the process now of um, working to get a trial in breast cancer started here um, at ASU in conjunction with the Mayo Clinic. So in conclusion, I think that there's a promise for a future where instead of dying of cancer, we see a pathway forward for living with cancer. And this is actually very consistent with what we know about cancer role in the evolution of life, that multicellularity has coexisted with cancer since the beginning of life. So now we return back to the crested cactus garden, and um, I want to leave you with this quote um, from Darwin, um, which inspired the name for our garden, which um, the garden is called Endless Forms Most Beautiful. Here's the Darwin quote. There's grandeur in this view of life from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Thank you all for listening to my talk. If you're interested in learning more, I do have a discount um, here just for people who have um, been here in the talk. You can um, get a discount directly from the publisher for the book. Um, this is also the link to the video if you're, if you're interested in that. And um, I have a lot of acknowledgments here. Uh, many people have helped with this. I can't even put everybody down who has um, helped to inspire this uh, approach and the work that I presented here in one way or another, um, but uh, I especially want to acknowledge the Arizona Cancer Evolution Center for um, making a lot of this work possible. So thank you also to all of you for your attention and time, and um, I look forward to speaking with you either in the question and answer session or if you want to follow up with me over email. Um, I'm really excited that I'm having the chance to interact with many people who I haven't before had the chance to meet or, or speak with. So, so thank you all.